Good morning. We are so glad that you've chosen to come and worship this morning. I'm going to ask you to uh, have prayer with me real quick, and then we will have a seat. You just, you just calm down there, mister. <laughs> Father, we are so grateful for a day that you've given us to come together to worship, to encourage each other, a day to come and celebrate, to celebrate moms the women in our lives who have poured into us, who have loved us, who have pointed us towards you. Father, we are so grateful for the women in our lives, for the women in this church, for what they mean to so many individuals and just the love that they share. Father, I pray that you would bless Bless all of the moms today. That you would just give them a day of rest, a day to just look back on all of the memories and to just relish the things that they've accomplished in their lives and their families and around them. Lord, we lift up so many who are hurting right now, those who are dealing with, with cancer, with, with illness, with different situations in life that are, that are just painful, that are stressful that you would provide comfort, that you would provide healing and counsel. And this morning as we, we celebrate these children, Father, may we, may we commit to raising them in your ways. May we commit to raising them as a congregation to be a part of their life, to pray for them, to be involved. And be with the parents as they raise their children. Father, that they would have, have the understanding of what difference you make in their lives as adults and how that transfers to their children. And be with Terry as he brings your message. Give him your words to speak. May our ears and our hearts be open to hear you today. And we ask all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. You may be seated. We are, once again, we're so grateful for a day. And, and moms, let me just say, thank you. We cannot thank you enough. We know that, you know that. But for the countless hours that you have poured into children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, other people's children, we appreciate it. Adult children, right? But we are so grateful for, for the love that you have shown, for the, the examples that you have set for so many. And uh, we have an opportunity this morning to get to see some, some babies. And I told Terry this morning in the early service, I said, it is, it is amazing that all these people came to hear you speak, and coincidentally, we have a baby dedication going on. It was just, it was uncanny. But... Uh, we are so glad, and I'm going to invite the babies and parents to go ahead and come on up, and Terry to come up and to, uh, to present these children. No, come on up here, because we're on Zoom now. This is always a uh, fun time in the life of our church. Uh, in our early worship this morning, uh, we had two that we dedicated. Uh, we dedicated Xander Jacob Elder, uh, who was born April the 6th of this year, uh, and his parents, Alex and Ashley Elder. We also uh, had uh, Tessa K. Ripley, uh, who was born October the 14th of 2020, uh, to Tyler and uh, Caitlin Ripley. And uh, I have a couple that I want to introduce that are here for this service. First of all, Ava. She's looking at me like, you don't have anything on me. This is Ava. Hey, Russell. 
Russell, wait. You'll get your turn in just a minute, okay? <laughs> but I want to introduce everybody to Ava Josephine Scovel, uh, who was born October the 27th of 2020. And uh, Shelby and Justin are uh, her parents. And uh, you got all decked out today, didn't you? Huh? Yeah, had to. Had to. Yeah. Mom have anything to do with that down here? Don't know. But uh, Josephine, are you willing to come to me? Huh? You willing to come to me? Oh. Now, you can step over here closer to me because I want people to be able to see her. Josephine, out here. Ava, I mean. What did I say? Josephine? <laughs> Ava. Ava. Well, I said, trust me, I know I've had the lapel mics eaten before. <laughs> she is a cutie. I'm going to let you go back to mom. Tessa wanted mom and dad more than she cared about me. But anyway, delighted, delighted. You're a cutie. Got big eyes. All right. I want Russell. And Jessica to step over here. How are you, big guy? No, you don't get a mic. <laughs> In fact, you don't even need a mic. Can you give me a high five? Yeah. All right. Good, good. <laughs> step on in here, oh. Jessica. This is uh, Russell Alexander Carey, born August the 22nd of 2018. Uh, Jessica Martinson and Michael are his uh, parents, and he is active in our Sunday school. <laughs> Underline, capitalize, and bold the word active. I, uh, I stop by occasionally, and uh, they're all in there having a great time, and Heidi and does a great job with them, and for that, uh, we are grateful. Um, you trying to read that, buddy? You can have it if you want it. Yeah, just never mind me, Russell. I'm just here. I'm, I'm just a stage. I'm a stage prop. You can have that, okay? No, you can't have those. This is why. This is why. Typically, we do it when they are infants. <laughs> they were a little late in the game, huh? Yeah, but they better late than never. Better late than never. As I shared with the group this morning. Uh, Scripture tells us that uh, people were bringing little children to Jesus, uh, but the disciples rebuked them. And the Scripture also tells us that when Jesus saw what the disciples were doing, he was indignant. And he said to his disciples, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. He went on to say, I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the child in his arms and he put his hands on them and he blessed them. And he called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. Think about that for a moment. Jesus said to those who were there, anyone who will welcome a little child like this welcomes me. I would simply ask parents and us as a congregation to understand that we are to see these little ones with the loving eyes of Jesus. And we are given a task, both as parents and as a congregation, to assist these children in growing as Jesus did, in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man. So, Jessica, Shelby, those of you who are a part of this congregation, I simply would ask you this. 
Are we willing to promise to love these kids unconditionally and to nurture them in a way that leads to faith and encourage them in the way that leads to everlasting life? And if you're willing to promise that, would you simply say, we will? We will. All right. I want us to have a word of prayer. Father God, we come to you grateful for the gift of children. Grateful for the gift of children created in your image. Father, we pray for the parents of these children. We pray that you would give them strength, that you might give them patience and wisdom as they seek to nurture these children into responsible human beings. Father, we pray that as a church, we would look to love them unconditionally. And that we would do that which we can do that might also nurture them in the way of faith. A faith that leads to everlasting life. But Father, as we dedicate these children this morning, we pray especially for them. Father, I pray that you would protect them. That you would keep them safe. Father, I pray that they would grow in a way that would come to embrace the teachings of your Son, Jesus Christ. Indeed, that they might grow in a way that would lead them to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life, that they might then live the remainder of their life with the assurance of life everlasting. Father, it's a prayer we offer in the name of your Son. Amen. By the way, I'm going to mention, I, Shelby, you've already been received your quilt, right? Have you already received your quilt? Yes, okay. Uh, our quilting group on Tuesday mornings, uh, one of the things they have provided now for a number of years is that when we do a dedication of babies or of children, they give to them uh, a quilt that can be a reminder of the fact that we as a congregation and as a church love them and care for them. So uh, that being said, I'm going to simply give, uh, your hands are full, both of your hands are full. i tell you what I'll do. I will carry these down and uh, Pam will give you quilts for Russell and we'll go from there. Thanks, Shelby. Thank you. You're welcome. I do want to mention, uh, we had a third uh, baby who was signed up for whatever reason. Uh, they are not here this morning, but I will see that they uh, receive uh, the certificate. Uh, young man by the name of Elijah James Chandler. Uh, his parents, um, uh, Tony and Casey Chandler, have been visiting Lyndon. They have not yet joined. Uh, but they have been visiting, and uh, those of you who have been parents, you know how it is with small children. Some Sundays you wake up and you're just not getting to church, and so uh, we hope that they're doing all right, and we will contact them uh, this week. Karen? Our next hymn Lord for the gift of children.
Our next hymn is Because He Lives.
creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, our dear God made them all. Each little flower that opens, each little bird that sings, God made their glowing colors and made their tiny wings. <coughs> all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, our dear God made them first thing I want to do uh, now is to simply begin by wishing all of you moms uh, a very happy and blessed Mother's Day. Uh, I have often said I don't know of any task any more difficult uh, than that of being a mom. Uh, the countless roles that you have to play and uh, that sort of thing uh, can sometimes be overwhelming. And as overwhelming as being a mom would normally be in a very normal year, uh, that has only uh, been more difficult uh, this past year. As uh, you've helped, and many of you have had to take on new roles uh, as a mom. And uh, I, we appreciate. All we can do is say thank you. Uh, and mom, I'll call you later. She, uh, she's on Zoom, so I'll make sure I get that in there. I don't want her calling during the service, you know, anything like that. I am going to begin by uh, presuming that you and I can agree on certain things. Number one, children are a gift. They're a gift from God. Created in his image. He has chosen to bless us with children. The second item I'm hoping that we can agree upon is that when it comes to nurturing children, it's not simply the responsibility of mom and dad and grandparents and aunts and uncles and other relatives. When it comes to nurturing children, uh, it is a responsibility for all of us. It's a responsibility for all of us individually, but it is also a responsibility for those of us who are a community of faith. This morning we're going to look at two passages of Scripture. Uh, and the reason we are is because uh, when it comes to Scripture and the life of Jesus... We know very little about his childhood. 
We all know the birth story. I mean, we celebrate Advent and Christmas. Uh, we know that uh, a census was to be taken, and so uh, Joseph and Mary made their way to Bethlehem, and that while they were there, the time came for Jesus to be born, and since there was no room in an inn, they borrowed a stable. And when Mary gave birth, Jesus was wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a borrowed manger. We also know that while they were there, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph and warned him not to go back. Uh, we know that uh, King Herod had put out a decree that all uh, Jewish males two years of age and younger were to be killed. Why? Because he was fearful of his throne. And so the angel of the Lord told uh, Joseph, he said, you take Mary and the child and we want you to cross the border into Egypt, what we now know as Egypt, and wait. And so they did. And then until after the death of Herod, when it was safe for them to return to Nazareth. We know the birth story. Uh, we know the end of the story. Uh, we know how Jesus borrowed a cult, and uh, made that processional into Jerusalem on what we now refer to as Palm Sunday. We know quite a bit about the final week of his life. We know that uh, during the course of that week, he taught and debated uh, with individuals, especially religious authorities. We also know that on Thursday of that week, uh, he borrowed another room, uh, in which he and his disciples could celebrate Passover and in which he could uh, institute uh, the Lord's Supper. We know that on uh, Friday of that week he was crucified and uh, when he was pronounced dead uh, and his body was taken down, he was placed in a borrowed tomb. In fact, as I began recounting uh, the beginning of his life and the end of his life this week, I thought uh, there's a sermon in there somewhat and somewhere about borrowed stuff. And uh, maybe one day I will uh, attempt to flesh that out. But as I said earlier, very little is mentioned about his childhood. And uh, the first place I want us to look this morning is found in Luke chapter 2. If you have your Bibles or New Testaments, I would invite you to open it uh, to Luke uh, chapter 2. Uh, this is... Um, uh, after Jesus has already been presented uh, to the temple on the eighth day following his birth, uh, he now uh, returns to the temple. Beginning in verse uh, 41, Luke tells us that every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival, note these next three words, according to to the custom, four words, according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Uh, thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among the relatives and friends, and when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying. And then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart, and Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. I think to really appreciate the story, we have to understand the setting of this story. For you see, 
the law required every male to go to Jerusalem to participate in three feasts. Passover, Pentecost, and Feast of the Tabernacles. Unfortunately for many Jews who lived after the exile in regions distant from Jerusalem, uh, to fulfill that requirement became very difficult, almost impossible. However, residents of Palestine were willing to make every effort to be in Jerusalem for at least one of the feasts each year. And so Joseph was simply following current practice. That is, he was acting, as it says in verse 42, according to custom, the custom of the law, in his annual visit to Jerusalem for the Passover. I think it's also helpful to understand that all women, although women did not uh, come under the requirements of the law, many of them, like Mary, would accompany the male members of their families on the, these pilgrimages. It's also interesting to note that as Jewish boys reached puberty, uh, they became a son of the law. In other words, they became a responsible member of the covenant community and as such were now obligated to fulfill the law's requirements. So consequently, at the age of 12, Jesus joins his elders on their annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem for Passover. Now, again, because they could not necessarily travel to all three, Many pilgrims who had gone there for uh, the Passover feast would depart from Jerusalem after only two days because that, well, that was what was required for their participation in the ritual of the Passover. And often what we probably do already know is that many of those making their way to and from Jerusalem would travel in a caravan of relatives and, and acquaintances from the same town or at least the same region. Which as such made it very, very easy for the absence of a 12-year-old boy in that caravan to simply go unnoticed until time came for them to set up camp for the first night. And that's exactly when Mary and Joseph realized that for whatever reason, Jesus wasn't with the group. I don't have to tell you as parents or grandparents that if a child or a grandchild suddenly goes missing, you are in a panic which I assume was pretty much the same state that Joseph and Mary were in. For Luke tells us that they went back to Jerusalem to find Jesus. And after three days of searching, they do indeed find him. Needless to say, Mary is not too happy about it. She's not at all happy about the fact that he had stayed behind, especially when they had been searching for him for three days. But lo and behold, there he was, 12-year-old Jesus in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. At the same time, Jesus' reply shows that he was completely surprised that they didn't know where he was. Note the phrase of his response. In my father's house. It's a phrase that some translations will translate engaged in my father's business. Jesus' description of the temple of the house of his father would seem to imply two different things. One, Mary and Joseph should have known that he would be found in the temple. 
Therefore, they didn't really be, need to be searching for him. And secondly, his description of the devil as his father affirms his relationship to the God of Israel. Luke also notes, however, that once he's found and once Mary has kind of probably, eh, she's made her feelings known, let's just put it that way. And after Jesus has responded, uh, Luke uh, leads us to believe that this particular temple experience didn't alter the status of Jesus in the home. For he tells us that upon their return to Nazareth, Jesus continued to lead a normal and expected life of a child, being obedient, according to Luke, to Joseph and Mary. And in a summary statement about the childhood of Jesus in verse 52, Luke says, and Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Now, if you were listening very closely to what I read earlier and what I just said, you'll notice a little bit of difference. The NIV translates it, growing in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. It is the Amplified Bible translation that states it, and Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and became and in stature and in favor with God and man. And I'll be honest with you, I kind of like the way the Amplified Bible has translated that particular phrase um, because it is a phrase that reflects continuous growth, which I think is an invaluable message to all of us who think we are adults. Okay? But it is also a statement that's very similar to verse 40, which is the verse prior to what we read this morning. In Luke chapter 2, which says, And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Boom. Now let's fast forward. Let's skip ahead some 18 years. Uh, following the story of Jesus' baptism, following the story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, I want us to turn to Luke chapter 4, and I want us to begin reading there. For in verse 14, Luke tells us that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in the synagogue, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, notice these next few words, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Luke says he then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Ever wonder why Luke tells us that Jesus went to the synagogue on the Sabbath? Oh, he just read the answer because it was his custom. which the follow-up question becomes, why on earth would that have been his custom? Let me ask you this. Could it be because of the way he had been raised? Remember verse 52 of chapter 2? And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man? 
I've always been fascinated by that verse. I've always been upset that we don't know more about his childhood than we actually know. I mean, obviously, following his baptism and his temptation in the wilderness, we know about those adult years, those three years approximately, from the time he began his earthly ministry until it was over. But his childhood, we know very little. Other than the fact that as a child, he had traveled with Joseph and Mary to Jerusalem on an annual basis. Why? Because it was their custom. And that now as a 30-year-old beginning his public ministry, he goes to the synagogue. Why? Because it was his custom. You say, Terry, what's, what's the point here? The point is this. When it comes to growing in stature, that is, when it comes to growing physically, or when it comes to uh, growing mentally, learning cognitive skills and, and those sorts of things, uh, growing in wisdom, when it comes to growing in favor with men, that is, when it comes to understanding uh, personal relationships and the emotional side of things, uh, we really don't have much of a problem with those things in terms of understanding that we have a responsibility to see to it that our children are growing in those areas. For example, when a child is born, shortly after they're born, where do they go? Well, you take them back to the doctor. The doctor's going to weigh them and he's going to measure them. And you're going to have return appointments in which each time you go, they're measured and they're weighed. Why? Because we want to make sure they're growing the way they should be growing physically. As parents, as grandparents, we do whatever we got to do to make sure that they're growing physically. Uh, we provide a roof over their head. We put food on the table hoping they'll eat. Mom, forgive me. Uh, how many of you have ever said, you cannot get up from this table until you clean your plate? Anybody ever say, am I the only one that had a parent that ever said that? And occasionally on that plate would be English peas. Let me just tell you up front, confession, I hate English peas. I don't like the taste. I do not like the texture. And there were times when literally everybody in my family would be up and gone from the table and there I would sit, staring at a small group of English peas. But mom understood. You need to eat the various food groups, you know. Uh, that's the one thing about turning 18 and going off to college. You eat what you want to eat. Sometimes you pay for it later. <laughs> but nevertheless, we want our children to be fed uh, food that is nutritious, that will help them grow physically. And we make it a priority, quite honestly, as parents and grandparents to see to it that our children are growing physically. Likewise, uh, we as parents and grandparents, we want our children and grandchildren, we want to make sure they're growing uh, in wisdom. That is, they're growing in the cognitive uh, aspects of life, the motor skills of life. Uh, everybody's excited when the child first learns to roll over. And then when they start trying to get up on their hands and knees to crawl, 
And then lo and behold, pretty the next thing you know, they're, they're grabbing hold of things and they're standing up and they're trying to walk and they fall and we do what we can to protect them. Uh, child-proofing our homes and that sort of thing. Uh, but that's just a part of, of growing up physically and, and learning cognitive skills. And, and we try to teach them as best we can. Ever tell to your uh, children or grandchildren, don't touch that, it's hot. Sometimes their cognitive learning only comes through experiential learning. And you go ahead and touch it anyway and you make, make, make a mental note here, don't ever touch anything that they tell me is hot. We do that sort of thing. And then, lo and behold, before you know it, I mean, it seems like it's almost in the blink of an eye. Uh, they're up and they're running and they're playing. And it's the first day of school. And, they, you know, you take the pictures of them walking into the school for the very first day. And as parents, uh, we make it a priority uh, that they go to school and that they study and that they learn. Why? Because it's important that they grow in wisdom, that they grow in their understanding of the world and uh, of life and that sort of thing. You know, I, I remember uh, growing up, you were going to school whether you wanted to or not. And uh, there were plenty of times I was not, but I was there. Uh, because that was just a part of growing up. That was a part of life. You went to school. You went to school. Wisdom. He grew in wisdom. He grew. Uh, he, he, they found him in the temple. What was he doing? He was sitting in the temple courts, what? Listening to the teachers and asking questions. That becomes a part of it. We want our children to grow up not afraid to ask questions in order that they might learn. We want them to grow up with some critical thinking skills that will allow them to be able to uh, respond to various situations. You know. It says he grew in favor with man. Um. Uh, most of you probably, uh, if you can't remember from your own experience, you can remember from the experience of your child or grandchild uh, when they wanted something as a toddler or as a young child. What do you say? Please? And if you get what you want, what do you say? Russell gave us a perfect example. Thank you. I no longer have a bulletin, but Russell said thank you. And that's good with me. We want them to learn how to deal with emotions and terms of relationships. And we make it a priority of doing what we can do as parents and as grandparents to the very best of our ability to help them understand what it means to be a social being. I remember growing up, it was always, even my, my, my friends' parents, it was always Mr. and Mrs. Uh, I've talked about my good friend Dick. Uh, when I would go over to his house as a kid growing up, it was always Mr. Gray, Mrs. Gray. It was never Richard and Helen. Not until they gave me permission. But we want our kids to grow in a responsible way when it comes to relationships and social interaction and all those sorts of things. And we make it a priority. We make it a priority for them to grow physically and to grow mentally and to grow socially. But Luke also tells us that he grew in favor with God. Hmm. Yeah. This is where we sometimes find ourselves having problems. Let me tell you something. When you read child development and they talk about all these other areas, the one area that so often they tend to uh, omit or ignore is favor with God. the spiritual dimension of our lives. 
And the problem is that they simply are ignoring the fact that as human beings, we are spiritual beings created in the image of God. And the question becomes, where have, what have we made of that in terms of our priorities as parents and grandparents? Do we uh, believe it to be important? You know. Apparently Mary and Joseph did because Jesus went to the synagogue as was his custom. Apparently he had grown up going to the synagogue. Is it a priority? And it seems to me, and I'm just being brutally honest at this point, it seems to me that we live in a day and an age and a culture in which countless things become priorities in our lives. And that growing spiritually, growing in favor with God, is simply an afterthought. If we make it, we make it. If we don't, we don't. And I will tell you from one who has observed what is going on, it is becoming increasingly difficult for parents and grandparents to even make growing spiritually a priority. You know, we, we, we are having graduate recognition next Sunday. One of the reasons we're doing it next Sunday is because the following Sunday, we had students who will be graduating high school at 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Really? Listen. To grow as Jesus grew, sometimes we as parents and grandparents need to get our priorities in order. For I will tell you this, out of all of the areas of growth that we have talked about, there is only one that will determine our grandchildren and children's eternal destiny. And that is growing as Jesus grew in favor with God. Having said that, to those of you who are parents and grandparents and others, I would also say that spiritual growth uh, may be among the most difficult kinds of growth. Because you see, it is a very, very complex issue. Um, that I think we have to understand. And quite honestly, it takes more than just parents and grandparents. And so for those of you who, uh, if you thought, well, we're kind of getting off early today, I, I just sit and listen to him tell parents and grandparents what they need to be doing. Let me, let me really narrow in on this community of faith. Because here's the thing. We have the opportunity as a community of faith, as a church, to not only encourage parents, but more importantly, to assist parents in helping their children grow in favor with God. We, as a community of faith, have the opportunity, and I would dare say privilege, to make a lasting imprint upon children when it comes to faith. And I know sometimes we tend to think that what we're doing really doesn't matter. Let me tell you something, it matters. 
And an awful lot of parents are looking for help. An awful lot of children are reliant upon help. It's the reason, as I've said before, when it comes to uh, preschool and our children's area, we should never, ever, in a church this size, be lacking for people who are willing to invest in the lives of children. Simply should not happen. Furthermore, if we as a church want to continue to attract young families with small children, we're going to have to step the game up when it comes to those willing to work. That being said, parents, back to you. If we're going to be willing to step our game up and do what we can do to help you with your child in regards to nurturing them in their faith, you have to be willing, on the other hand, to make nurturing your child in faith a priority in your own life. And I'm going to end where I started. Children are a gift from God. And children can take you to the highest of highs and they can take you to the lowest of lows and sometimes they can do it within a matter of hours. But God loves them. And they're our responsibility. And we should be willing to love them as well and nurture them in a faith that leads to everlasting life. Maybe this morning, for you to be a part of a community of faith that can do that, you yourself, as a parent, a grandparent, or just a person who attends, in order for you to do that, you have to first and foremost make sure that Jesus is your Lord and Savior and that you have committed your life to being His follower and His disciple. If you're here and that's a decision you've never made, then I would simply say to you, I can't think of a better day. It may be that you're here this morning and you are a Christian and, 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 and you're a parent, grandparent. You may just be an adult in the life of this church, but you suddenly go, you know what, Terry? I've not made nurturing children a priority in my life. Then maybe you simply need to come and spend time in prayer asking God to impress upon you again the need and the challenges of helping children grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with man and with God. I don't know how God speaks to you this morning. I, I, I really don't. I've always, that's the one thing I've always been amazed by. Is I really don't know how God's spirit works. All I do know is that it does work and that he does speak. Maybe this morning you simply need to stay right where you are. And as we sing a song of response, pray. Just pray. Pray not only for the children, but pray for the parents. Pray for grandparents. Pray for Sunday school teachers. Pray for those who work with our kids. Father God, we come to you this morning. And Father, I'm grateful I'm grateful for Joseph and Mary who understood the importance of faith in the living of their lives, who made it a habit of attending worship. The fact that it was their custom. And Father, the fact that it was of such importance that it became indelibly printed in the life of Jesus himself. Who as he began his public ministry went to the synagogue on the Sabbath as was his custom. 
Father, I pray for those who are parents. Father, I pray for those who are grandparents or who have impact in the lives of grandchildren. Father, help us to be the kind of people and to be the kind of church that will do all we can do to nurture the faith of our children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Karen, come and lead us in a song of response, please. Let's stand our hymn of invitation, God Will Take Care of You. just say once again how much I appreciate your coming and sharing with us on this Mother's Day. Moms, I hope you have a great day. I hope you have a blessed day. And uh, for all of us, as we leave this place this morning, my prayer would be that we would go in the grace and the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. With that, you're dismissed. <laughs>